There is nothing apart from forgiveness more psychologically sound and good for the human spirit than gratitude. There is nothing that moves us to a place of joy faster than gratitude. There is nothing that does more for us than gratitude. It is an antidote to materialism. It is an antidote to want. It is an antidote to jealousy, covetousness, all sorts of things that we struggle with as a people. Gratitude helps us focus on the goodness that is. Gratitude helps us appreciate what it is that we have been given, material and immaterial. When we speak spiritually of gratitude, of course, we're speaking of what the Lord has done. And if we're honest, if we think about it from the stories that we all share, from the framework, from the belief system we share, we come from God, we live our lives before God, God is our provider, our sustainer, our maintainer, our friend, our companion, our guide. He's our savior. He's our king. All comes from God. We didn't create ourselves, nor did we create anything around us. We work for a living, but we simply redistribute the material he's given and provided. We don't make life, but we use the life around us for our benefit. Often, we use it destructively. Sadly, we often abuse it. But gratitude is that which helps us just get a hold of ourselves. It's an antidote to depression. It's an antidote to all kinds. I'm not talking about clinical depression. There are psychological states in which gratitude is just simply not possible, and we often need help with that beyond uh, a glad game, so to speak. But gratitude can be something that wards off situational depression. Gratitude can help us see life from a perspective of at least the cup being half full or quarter full, or whatever we deem it to be. It keeps us on the side of something positive. I don't have a long Thanksgiving sermon today. Some of you can be thankful for that. (laughs) What I have is words of encouragement to you as you go into this season because there are so many layers for us to unpack. I want you to take time this Thanksgiving not just to feast, not just to gather everybody or to run here and there, but I want you to take time to engage a couple of spiritual exercises. I want you to pause in a day somewhere for 15 minutes. Quiet yourself and reflect on what it is that you have to be thankful for can take the form of a prayer. It can be something you're just simply silent to and you let realization upon realization roll over you. It could be a song that you choose to sing. But take a minute this week and let the grace of God in joy and gratitude flow over you because there are so many things we have to be grateful for. We say our God is good, and yet we don't live as if he is. We say our God is great, but we don't live as if he is. When we serve a God who is both good and great, we serve in joy and gratitude. Our posture before God can sometimes be supplication. Lord, I'm in need. Please help me in my need. Lord, I've sinned. Please forgive me in my error. That can be our posture. 
But our regular posture needs to be, Lord, I have received so very much, and I'm so very thankful. In addition to the spiritual exercise you do this week, take time around your family table at Thanksgiving. Do whatever your tradition is, but take a moment to name something important in your life that you're grateful for. Family is usually an easy one, an obvious one. A home is sometimes an easy and obvious one, even the food on the table. But reflect for a few minutes, what is it exactly that God has done for you? You can extend it to the American side of the holiday. What does it mean to live in this country with the graces that we enjoy here despite our many troubles and divisions and problems? What can we celebrate in the graces of a country that remains essentially free? What does it mean to be able to gather in worship or in family or in home? If our people will cultivate a sense of gratitude and joy, our worship will fundamentally change. Because I know we have an attitude about worship. What we think worship is, is what we're going to experience when we come here. Most of us think of church or worship as a series of things in the bulletin that we're going to do. It's a program. It's an experience. I'm going to come, was it a good worship experience or not a good worship experience? Was the pastor interesting or was he boring? Or was he irrelevant? Did he lose me? Was the special music in tune or not? This is where we break down. Because worship isn't what happens here per se, it's what you bring when you come. It's a spirit within you. I have come this day to praise the Lord. Can you say that with me? I have come this day to praise the Lord. Can we now say it? I'm not cajoling you. If you don't want to say it, don't say it. But if you can find some joy in it, let's say it with as much joy as you can put into your tone. I have come today to praise the Lord. When you come in a spirit of joy and worship, you bring that with you. All of us are blessed. All of us are blessed. It changes your perspective on everything from the hymn chosen for the day to how well the pastor did. You won't have to eat me for lunch anymore. Our text today is very clear. The Lord has done it this very day. Let us rejoice and be glad. And that is the essence of it all. In addition to all the things I've said, the foundation of our gratitude, our joy, and our praise is that God has done it. Let's never be fooled into thinking we've done it ourselves. Some of you have heard me speak of this at other Thanksgiving sermons, but there is a famous Bart Simpson quote from one of the episodes of The Simpsons where they sit down for Thanksgiving dinner and Bart gives to give the prayer. And he says, well, Lord, it looks like we paid for all of this stuff ourselves, so thanks for nothing. I know that functionally we operate that way sometimes. We work hard. We think somehow we owe nobody anything for that. And yet, how our perspective changes, how our day shifts, how our lives take on a different tone and color if we would instead adopt a spirit of gratitude. Lord, thank you. You have done it. This is the day, and I will rejoice and be glad in it. And then in Psalm 100, it doesn't say, whimper to the Lord all the earth. It says, shout for joy. Worship with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. I love verse 3 because it puts everything in context, doesn't it? Know that the Lord is God. And what's the corollary to that? I am not. Know that he is God and I am not. Know that he is God and you are not. Because when we take that pressure away from us, we know that we don't provide for ourselves, that we're provided for. We know that we haven't made ourselves. We have been made and therefore we belong to him. Our life becomes contextualized because he who made us, we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. 
I'm not too wild about the last part of that. Sheep are the dumbest things on earth. But then again, I suppose I act pretty stupidly sometimes. I won't say anything about how you are. Probably the same on occasion. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. We don't have a temple. We don't have a city wall with fortifications and gates. Our gate is more or less open all the time. But we enter into this space. We enter into his space with a spirit of thanksgiving and praise. For the Lord is good and his love endures how long? Forever. His faithfulness continues through every generation, and we've seen that. Generations here to welcome new candidates, new newly baptized members into fellowship. This is our experience. This is what we see and what we've done. The Lord is good, and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues throughout the generations. And so we not only have gratitude, we have hope. For God is never-ending, and his graciousness never ceases, and his love is enduring because it is part of who he is. He's ours forever. And we're given this season to rejoice in that. May the Lord bless you this Thanksgiving as you share with one another, as you eat, as you talk of his goodness, as you celebrate his wonder.